So uh, you don't need, for the projects, you don't need to understand every single detail in your papers that I suggested. You just need to know what's the story, uh, what are the governing equations, the main assumptions that led to the final results, and uh, the necessary steps, the key steps. And finally, the, 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 there is final result, how to apply it. And if it's simple enough, it will be great if you apply it and compare it to those terms or whatever. Okay? So uh, you don't need to understand every single uh, step in, the, in their derivations. It's, uh, it's, it's quite hard, I know. Any question? We will, uh, we will, so we need two days, right? And uh, the first day is next Wednesday, I guess, right? It's not, yeah, it's next Wednesday. And then the finance day. So uh, one of two solutions, either we need three volunteers to present in the next Wednesday, or we postpone it to the following Monday. But uh, we don't have a so we cancel this lecture and we just do it in the next Monday. We, we find a, a good slot for all of us. Okay, just think about who will decide next time, but keep it in mind. If we have three volunteers to do it at the first time, next Wednesday, we'll go check. Okay, we're done with uh, what I wanted to cover in this course. Uh, and uh, we have two advanced lectures. This is one of them, aerodynamics of flapping flight. So just to give you an idea, this is uh, what I mean by flapping flight. So this is the hook moth insect at the hovering position. It moves its wings back and forth. So uh, this is a slow motion video. So this guy moves at 26 hertz, so 26 flaps per second. So it's much faster uh, in contrast to birds. Birds are much slower, it's like one hertz or so. Just to give you an idea how this achieves hovering. So if you have a if you have a wing section like this, so this is the leading edge, okay, this dot, and it's moving in the downstroke, some speed and angle of attack as you see. It experiences upward lift and opposing drag, so it goes all the way and then reverses and comes back. And uh, when we say symmetric flapping, this is what we mean, it comes back with the exact same speed and angle of attack, so it will experience the same upward lift and opposing drag. And uh, because they are symmetric, if you do this fast enough, the drag <coughs> forces will cancel each other and the lift forces will augment each other. And uh, if you flap strong enough, high enough frequency, high enough amplitude, hopefully the lift is strong enough to cover, to uh, carry the weight. Okay? So this is how insects balance their weight in the hovering position. Any question about that? Okay, so uh, what's the problem here? So, uh, what's new? So actually, biologists, as you can guess, started analyzing aerodynamics of flapping flight a long time ago. And they concluded for almost a century that uh, insects cannot fly, according to our knowledge. But it turns out that they are, they are just flying, right? So how this happens? The balance no, it's not working. How can I do this? Oh. So we have this guy. Pin. <coughs> the balance dictates that the lift has to equal the weight, or at least the average lift has to equal the weight. And the lift, by definition, is one half rho v squared area times the lift coefficient, right? Of course, we know the density of the air, and uh, now let me change this color. If you 
you are a biologist, you will know the weight of the insect, right? You can just catch them, measure its wing. And you know the area of its wing, right? And uh, remember, if you have an insect like this, and this is the wing, so it moves with an angular velocity omega back and forth. So if you have a section, if you have a section like this, wing section on the distance r, the forward speed, because this v is not the forward speed, it's, it's not, we're not talking about a fixed wing airplane and it's moving forward, there's no forward speed, I'm the, the insect is hovering. So this v is just coming from the back and forth motion of the wing. If you have a section here at the distance r, so simply this translational speed is omega r, right? This your v. So uh, again, biologists, they were able to measure the frequency, so they can get the speed. So we have the weight, velocity, area, and the density, of course, of the air. So what can we get out of this equation? What can we get? What's the only unknown now that you can get? What's the only thing? CL. So from here, we can get the CL required for insects to fly, right? That's OK. But then you look at this value. Is it uh, exorbitantly high? Is it feasible or not? So we have this classic figure for conventional aerodynamics, how the maximum CL, you have a maximum CL when flying some wing, I mean, you have maximum CL that you cannot attain. I mean, go with the maximum angle of attack that you like, you will not get higher left than this, right? So the maximum CL is actually a function of Reynolds number only, interestingly. <laughs> and uh, it decreases with, the Reynolds number decreases, so, uh, Insects operate here, right? So this is airplanes. This is insects. So they have much lower, according to conventional dynamics, this is the maximum CL attainable by insects, okay? That should be attainable by insects. It turns out that this value is much larger than the maximum CL that they can attain that's coming from here. In fact, it's much larger. It's two to three times this CL max that's coming from here. Yes? There's this CL um, uh, taking into account the difference of the airfoil type and shape and things like that? It turns out that it's not much of a difference for uh, depending on the, the airfoil shape. I mean, for, for most airfoils, they follow the same thing. Yes. Uh, may I ask about how is this the CL max correlated over here? How? I'm sorry? I mean, how is it calculated? How is this calculated? Yeah, that's the only You can go simply and measure it. Oh, is it from experiment? Yeah. Okay. Or from computational CFD. That's uh -huh. But this is measured. What was the question? No, no it's okay. Okay. So, uh, from this, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is that uh, insects must rely on unconventional lift mechanisms. It's not the usual lift mechanism that we uh, live with in conventional planes. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So until 1996, this is, uh, I mean, I can, I can track back papers up to 1918. I, I have these papers. And from 1918 up to 1996, uh, people keep invoking unconventional lift mechanisms. We have several tens of papers that they conclude by insects must rely on unconventional lift mechanisms. We don't know what, what are these. Okay, we, they keep invoking unconventional lift mechanisms. In this paper in Nature by Ellington, he's in the University of Cambridge, and as you can see, it's, it's now more than 1,400 citations. Uh, they discovered it for the first time. They said, okay, now we know what is the unconventional lifting mechanism that insects exploit to keep themselves aloft. It turns out to be, as the, the, the title may tell, it's a leading edge vortex. So just to give you an idea about that, I mean, we, we know our usual lifting mechanism, right? What's our usual lifting mechanism? The lift is due to what? 
The lift is due to what? When you have a U like this, lift is due to what? Circulation. Circulation, very good. So we have a bound circulation, gamma V, and we have lift due to bound circulation. So it turns out that insects, there is a vortex here. It's a, it's a real vortex. It moves with the flow. Okay, so you can you can see gamma leading edge vortex forms near the leading edge, so this is why it's called leading edge vortex. And it's there, so it's in the same sense, in the same sign, the same rotation wise, like the gamma B. So uh, it simply adds to the lift. If it's attached to the airfoil, it doesn't go away. If it just remains there, it's as if you, you have your rho u gamma bound that we used to, but you also have something like rho u gamma leading edge vortex, and it's an, an additional lift. Okay. Some CFD results uh, conclude by showing that this leading edge vortex contributes by about 40% of the lift. It's, it's much. I'm just reminding you about something. Last time we discussed it in the in the last minute, if you, if you remember. So uh, we have some. Do you remember last time when we said if you have U like this in potential flow, in inviscid flow, no viscosity, no shear stress, so there is no tangential force, there is no shear, it's only pressure force, right? So you have. This is the normal force, normal force coefficient, if you want to say. So this is what, what we should see in inviscid flow. Normal force, because it's, it's either pressure or shear. We don't have shear, so it's all pressure distribution. If you integrate the pressure distribution, which is normal to the surface, you get a force that is normal to the surface. This should be the picture that we see in our undergrad course. On the other hand, this is not what we see. What we see is that it's a force that is perpendicular to the free stream, the lift coefficient, right? Which is maybe 2 pi sine alpha. So how come we get this guy, whereas we expect to see this guy? In order to get this guy, there must be a force that is tangent to the surface. So. So that if this is the component normal to the surface, 2 pi sine alpha times cosine alpha, this would be the component tangent to the surface, 2 times sine again, so it's sine squared. What is this force? This is what we discussed last time. We said this force that is tangent to the surface is actually called suction force, and it's near the leading edge. And why is that? Because, because of you have a rounded leading edge, like this, and you have an infinite pressure near the rounded leading edge. This is an infinite pressure, much hard pressure here, right? So it has, because of the round, rounding of the leading edge, it has a forward component. It's an infinite pressure times almost zero width. So you get a finite thing. What you get here is this suction force, C suction force. And it turns out to be exactly the same as this value. So the addition, the vectorial addition of the normal force and the suction force, you get the left that is perpendicular to our free stream. This is what we have, okay? This is what we discussed last time. Then we said, if you have instead a sharp edge, not a rounded leading edge, do you remember what happened? So now we lose the suction force, so we only have a normal force, Cn, right? And instead of the normal force being the component of the lift, now the lift is the component, is the vertical component of the normal force. So you lose much lift, right, by cosine squared alpha. In addition, you get dragged because this, this is your resultant now. Over there, this was my resultant. Here, this is my resultant. So you have lift and you have drag. 
Over there, there is no drag. Inverted flow, no shear, and away from separation, there is no drag. Here we have drag. Okay? The drag is simply C and the tan alpha. If you have short, short leading edge, and this is associated by flow separation at this, so there is no there is no flow around the leading edge like here, but there is separation, and maybe reattachment later if the angle of attack is small, and you have a vertical region here. So this is one reason you you might have a leading edge vortex. But anyway, here we get a lot of drag, right? <laughs> the lift that you expect from the potential flow theory is much less by cosine squared, and we're going to discuss in more detail later. But in addition to this usual lift, we may have lift due to the leading edge vortex. Okay, so now this is your lift due to your bound, but there is additional lift due to the leading edge vortex, okay? We will discuss it in more detail, but any questions so far about this, these pictures? Yes, later. So, uh, so does that mean that the sharp leading edge is better? Does it no. There's no way? So, let's see. First of all, drag-wise, no. So, the drag to lift ratio for a sharp nose will always be larger than the drag to lift ratio. Okay. These are the classical results. You will find it in Schlechting, Eldenhams of the Airplane Book. Lift-wise, it depends on how stable this leading edge vortex is. If it's stable, in the sense that it's attached to the wind, yes, you will get larger lift in, in total. So uh, what I'm trying to say, actually, there is a paper by Schaffman. He showed that, you know, and you, you guys can do it using the tools that you learned in this class. So you have a flat plate, just steady flat plate, whatever, and you add a vortex on the top of it somewhere. Some location, take a location and put a vortex, like this guy. And you compute the lift. What do you expect? Larger lift or lower, smaller lift? So, what he did is that he showed that if you have a vortex on the top of the airfoil, in the upper surface of the airfoil, you get more lift. Okay? <laughs> so, this follows the same behavior. If this vortex is attached, you will get more lift. What do you mean attached or stable? So here is the thing, is that actually leading edge vortex is not something new that Ellington discovered in 1996. The aeronautical engineering community knew it for a long time. But it was the first time to be discovered as uh, being exploited by insects. Being exploited, I, I mean actually it's the main lifting mechanism for insects. Without the leading edge vortex, like we have discussed, all biologists concluded that insects cannot fly, okay? They cannot generate the required lift coefficient to sustain their weight. So we have unstable leading edge vortices and stable